invite you to pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some of you may remember uh, the name Amy Carter. Uh, I think she was about nine years old when her uh, father, Jimmy Carter, became president in 1976. And as you can think about any child growing up in the White House, they have resources, let's just say, that most people don't have, right? People that they're, at, you know, calling, that they can call at any time for help. So, interesting enough, um, she was having a little trouble with her homework when she was about in fourth grade. And uh, some question about uh, the Industrial Revolution, must have been a history class. Uh, fourth grade, that seems pretty deep, doesn't it? But anyway, so uh, her mother, uh, Rosalind, right, she uh, called one of, their, one of the aides that knew, knew stuff like this. Maybe left a message, didn't, you know, maybe didn't get personally talk to him. Uh, and this aide was in the labor department or whatever. And anyway, well, this aide, not having known the full context, thought it was actually maybe something from the president that needed information about, for whatever reason. And it was a Friday afternoon, and this aide got a team together working feverishly all weekend to do this research on the Industrial Revolution. They figured this president had a speech or something because they didn't get the whole context. And a truck comes a couple days later <laughs> on Sunday afternoon with a truck full of a computer printout, you know, back in the days when they had all the printer computer printout stuff probably all hooked together, right? Um, with all this research this team had worked on two, for two days, around the clock, on this, getting this, gathering some information on the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, unbelievable what they did. And they were so embarrassed, you know, mom and uh, was so embarrassed. Yeah, but Amy did get to use the research on Sunday afternoon. And uh, uh, some of it, <laughs> a little bit. And she got a C plus on her paper. <laughs> Uh, so just points to interestingly to think about people like her and you know living in the president's family in the White House there um, they have all this resources at their fingertips and you might think yeah I'm not like one of the Amy Carters of the world or uh, famous or secretary of state princes princesses whatever you might be and sometimes we think wow if only I had access to or I had this kind of pull or this kind of influence and remember this though brothers and sisters uh, let's see who is the one that uh, that we are in the family of God that uh, a child of God of the of the God the Father the creator of all things uh, through Christ we have inheritance that's like we have the greatest resources of all that are in us through, through Christ, don't we? And uh, we maybe, maybe you say, well, yeah, okay, I do. And, you, know, you may not be able to get a, a courtside seat at a Blazer game at your, at your just call and fingertips, but you have a seat with the Lord, right? The God of the universe in prayer through Christ. And what a privilege. Look at you, a son and daughter of the king. And that's who you are in Christ. And do we sometimes forget about all that we have in Christ? And they, as Layla and I were talking about prayer, and you know, we work and strive and do all these things and kind of think it's all up to us. And then he says, you know, in everything, bring it to me. All your prayers and supplications, bring it in prayer. And God hears and God answers. He loves it when his children pray. And... Uh, as much as we think, yeah, I wish I was one of those blue bloods or born with a silver spoon or whatnot, uh, you do have uh, amazing access, right, to the resources of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we read verses I'll talk about later, uh, verses of uh, hope and promise. And even in James 5, 16, it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? That's, that's who... Uh, that's the resources. Those are the resources we have through, through Christ. And so I'd like to uh, have that be a starting kind of theme as we think about God's messengers. We're going to talk about the, the prophets, especially the prophets that, that uh, uh, spoke to Israel, the northern kingdom. If you remember, if you were here last week, we talked about the, 
division of the kingdom from southern kingdom and northern kingdom in Israel and all the fractions and, and disappointments. And that northern kingdom, not that southern kingdom was perfect at all, and they needed to hear the word of the Lord too, but there were many prophets sent to the northern kingdom because of all their just idolatry and just pagan practices that they were adopting. And so we see the prophets again being uh, God's messengers, and especially as we are looking at the northern kingdom today. Um, as I just mentioned, the nation of Israel had rebelled from God. They were worshiping pagan gods. And uh, the word that God gives to the prophets uh, could be summed up in one word. Uh, the nation, as they were sent to the northern kingdom and to others, but in this sense of today, God sent prophets to the northern kingdom to call his people back to obedience. Hey, come back. You're worshiping all these other things. You're following other gods. And come back. Look at who God is, the one true God of the universe who cares for you, who loves you, who wants to bring you back into his fold. And God's relentless, and he will do whatever it takes. And uh, in a, over a period of about a couple hundred years, um, it's that divided kingdom and all the brokenness in the northern kingdom especially, God sent uh, many prophets uh, to the kings in Israel and over a period of about 200 years. Um, interestingly enough, um, the only prophet really that the northern kingdom heard and obeyed was Jonah. And the people that Jonah went to were these pagan Ninevites, <laughs> not even Israel. So interesting how the word of the Lord was, or, and sometimes it was temporarily followed, but never long-lasting. And uh, uh, God still was calling, though. He was relentless. Even when the people were not hearing and would not receive the prophets, God would still send a message that he desired to get through to the hearts of people. Uh, today, we'll especially look at uh, the prayers and faithfulness of Elijah the prophet. And I'm going to be highlighting a few verses from uh, this passage in 1 Kings. Um, but I'm, before that, I want you to think about these things. And again, just a reminder as we're going through the story, just so good. I just have really appreciated my preparation and thinking. And I hope you're getting in the habit, too, of reading through the passages that are in the, the story for the week. And then uh, come and hear the message on Sunday. But uh, just such a good resource to have both the Bible and then that selected passages in the story and seeing how it all comes together. But um, Elijah lived about 800 years before Jesus. And again, this time of division in the kingdom of Israel, God was at work and he was going to make his plan work. Um, but it was, again, this period of some pretty dark days. And uh, last week we left off in 1 Kings and at the end of chapter 16, of 1 Kings, we read about another evil king that came upon the scene, and his name was King Ahab. And I'm just going to read a couple select verses from 1 Kings 16, uh, just to lead into our passage for today. Uh, 16, 29 through 33. And if you have your Bibles, or if you're looking and you can follow it in the story, 1 Kings 16 and 29, it says... Uh, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And it goes on to say, he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal, or Baal, and worship him. So here we go, this continual cycle of these kings of Israel taking foreign wives that worshipped other gods and took on all these other uh, godless practices. Um, and then uh, in the midst of this troubling time, Israel's going deeper and deeper into the worship of other gods. This is when Elijah goes to Ahab and wants to show him who the true God is is. The one true God is. Greater than all these other little g gods that were, you know, pagan gods and statues and Asherah poles that were used to be in all these pagan practices. 
Um, and Elijah gives Ahab a challenge, and, and Ahab accepts, and that's where we start with here um, in this uh, encounter with this, this prophet Elijah and his call to, to uh, show Ahab and the people who God really is. So I'm going to look at, again, 1 Kings 18, uh, beginning with verse 17. And again, you can follow along if you wish, or listen as I, I read through here. I'm going to read first uh, uh, about the first four verses, 17 through 21. Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? So they're not on really good terms, let's just say. He thinks Elijah's just a bunch of trouble, telling him all this stuff he doesn't want to hear, right? And Elijah replies, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel, assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? And that word kind of means, How long will you do this dance between gods? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. They were just at a loss. You know, maybe just confronted with that word that really struck to the heart. Or maybe they're just being dismissive, right? Maybe some of both. And so it goes on. And many of you may be familiar with how this all then happened. You may have saw that little sketch of that, of that video just, be, just as we started. But there's uh, two bulls that are presented then for sacrifice at Mount Carmel. And uh, the one, the people worshiping all these other gods and Baals, they have one bull and then Elijah has the other. And there's altar, there's wood, and they're going to call upon their god first with the, uh, the idolatrous uh, uh, prophets of Baal. They're going to start and they're going to call upon their god to miraculously consume this sacrifice. And so after that, it would be Elijah's turn. They're going to say, okay, whose God is greater? Whose God can miraculously consume this sacrifice without any, without any uh, fire? It only can come from God. And so the prophets of Baal go first, and it says in verse uh, 26, they took a bull, they prepared it, called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon. Answer us, they shouted. There was no response. Surprise, surprise. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. And it goes on to say in verse 27, Elijah taunts them. So not, not exactly the greatest uh, diplomat trying to soothe feelings, is he? So he taunts them, shout louder. Surely he's a god. Maybe he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be just woke up. You know, so he's just jabbing them. And they're doing their frenzy idol worship dance and thinking... Somehow their God, you know, their God's going to do something. And even just, you know, weird stuff. I mean, they're, they're cutting themselves, their swords and blood's flowing and just ah, weird stuff, but no response. Surprise, surprise. There's no God. They're all just idols. They're all false idols. And then in verse 30, uh, Elijah says to all the people, come here to me. And they repair the altar of the Lord. It says, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And so not only did he build an altar of which to put the wood and the, and the bull on, but then he pours what? He pours just a ton of water on this sacrifice. So what? no way could anything burn. Uh, it ranges the wood. Put, cuts the bowl into pieces as they would do with these sacrifices. Four large jars with water. Pour it on the offering and on the wood. Uh, and verse 34 it says, do it again. They did it again. Do it a third time. So this drenched uh, sacrifice. Just amazing. You see just all this water. And, 
in this dry time of a, of a drought and all this is going on. And uh, it says, then it goes on to say in verse 36, that's when Elijah prays. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back. What a beautiful, heartfelt prayer, right? Why is this? Not for, obviously not for Elijah's glory and look how great I am and I can call upon my God and, and defeat the prophets of Baal. But the, his desire that the people would know you, Lord, and that you're turning their hearts back again. And God answered, God honored Elijah's prayer. And we see there that great all-consuming fire of God, the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. All the people made an impact. The people heard, they saw, heard from Elijah, they saw what God had done, and they professed momentarily, but they did profess that the Lord was God, the one true God. I want you to hear this. And yes, Elijah was called in a unique way, in a unique time to speak to the people and to pray. But a reminder, too, that God delights in your prayers. The Lord loves to hear his children pray, just like a loving father, or a mom, or a dad would Loves to just see their children and be with them and hear them. And think about a child coming to their parents and just, just uh, how that interaction would happen. And uh, um, God delights in your prayers. Um, you know, and we might think, okay, oh, this is good. Looks like everything's going to go great from this time on. That, that uh, Ahab and even Jezebel would turn and become champions for the one true God. And Elijah would be just, you know pastor of some mega church in Israel, if they would have had that back in that day, right? And all the Baal worshipers would be baptized. And, you know, we put it in our terms today, right? But in whatever that would be worshiping the one true God back in that day. But that didn't happen. Uh, soon after this, Jezebel wants Ahab dead. And Elijah is literally running for his life and running without any hope. And even, look, even remembering himself, what God had done, Elijah and his frailness and his humanity, he's just beside himself and doesn't know what to do. It's just, I'm done. Just take my life for it. I hope that you can remember a couple of key things here as we, uh, as we think on this theme. Remember, you're never without hope because you're never without prayer. Let me say that again. You're never without hope. Because you're never without prayer. God hears you when you pray. And uh, you might think, nobody listens to me. I, I can't even get the plumber to call back, you know, when I call him for an emergency repair. But no, God, the God of the universe hears you when you pray. And your prayers matter to God because you matter to God. You're his child, as we talked about, the you know, son or daughter of the king, and he is continuing to work in you and, and with you and training, equipping you. And just as God's word says, uh, when a believing person prays, great things happen. And in James, there's that verse, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And as much as we all might just think, well, yeah, okay, I'm just kind of a normal person. I'm not this great prophet that has all these mighty things that I've seen in my life doing. I'm a normal person. I'm a normal student, uh, high school, middle school, grade school student, whatever, just working at my assignments, just doing what I'm called to do. You're just working at your job if you're employed or just caring for your family. But uh, think about this. You're not, none of us are normal if we're a follower of Christ, right? We're an ambassador. God's word calls us ambassadors. 
to bring the good news of God to all the world. And think about that, right? Like, that's a pretty high calling, high assignment. And so he is working in you and has an eternal assignment for you as you've been forgiven in Christ. You're, you've been, you're praying in the name of Jesus. And not that we are all proud and think, oh, look who I am. But um, we're, uh, we have that, that right humility that gets us focusing on things of God, apart, not just the things of this earth. Now, a lot, a lot of things in this world that don't make sense and the things that we pray for and the wars and rumors of wars and wildfires and Australia and challenges right here close to home, too. Uh, always keep our eyes seated, too, on things above, our hearts on things above. And uh, promising, uh, promised in God's word, if we endure, we will reign with him. And we disown him if we go back to the practices of like Ahab and Jezebel and disown God. Well, that's God allows that too. He will. If we disown him, he'll disown us. Endure, reign with him, and uh, trust that he's speaking today through his word and his spirit. I'd like to invite Robin to come forward. She has a poem that she's going to close us with today that uh, relates and a little word of introduction. So if you'd come forward, Robin, love the spiritual gift that God has given you and. You could uh, share that with us. Uh, from First Kings 19, which sure. frames this. So, okay. So in 1 Kings 19, after Mount Carmel, Elijah's not feeling so good about that experience um, because he knows Jezebel wants him dead. So King Ahab, we read that, told him um, that she wanted um, Elijah dead. So she sent him a message, by this time tomorrow you will be dead. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. He took his servant and he went to Beersheba in Judah. Leaving the servant there, Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of a tree and wished he would die. It's too much, Lord, he prayed. Take away my life, I might as well be dead. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. And an angel brings him bread and water and nourishes him. And he goes on a few days journey. Um, and then the Lord says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he tells his story. Lord Almighty, I have served you, you alone, and the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down the altars, killed all your prophets, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. And this is when God says, go out and stand before me on top of the mountain. And the Lord said to him, the Lord said to him, then the Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. The wind stopped blowing, and then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a soft whisper of a voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then God spoke to him and told him what to do next. So I'm wondering, how many of you are thinking, I wish God would speak to me as clearly as he spoke to Elijah? Maybe just a little bobblehead, side to side of it. <laughs> well, as we're learning, he does. Remember, God wasn't in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire. 
spoke through the whisper. So the question is, do you hear his whisper? Pastor John read us James 5, 16, and we've heard it a couple times. The prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. Well, I love the next verse. James 5, 17 says, Elijah was a man just like us. The Living Bible puts it this way. Elijah was as completely human as we are. Well, that's encouraging. So what can we learn from him? Elijah prayed, learning all about prayer. He was discouraged to the point he wanted to take his life, but at least he didn't do it. He went to God in prayer. And then he listened. 1 King 19 tells us that Elijah knew God wasn't in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire, which tells us he was actively listening for God to send a response to him. And when he heard the whisper, he got up and went to the entrance of the cave in ready position to hear what God had to say. How do we recognize the whisper? And that's what I hope will come through with this poem. It's a funny thing, when the Spirit gives me a poem, I often learn something, which is how I know it's not for me. As a spiritual gift meant to build up the church, I'm hoping that you'll gain some spiritual insight from this as well. It doesn't sound like thunder. It's a whisper in my soul something that says there's more to life to make me whole. It's not loud, but it's persistent and begs to be understood, remarkably consistent with higher purpose, greater good. It's not some fuzzy feeling, but rather makes things clear by timeless truth revealing to ears prepared to hear. I've come to know this voice and the silent way he speaks as the spirit of God's presence for the human soul who seeks. And though he may speak softly, if our hearts are open and true, the power of his word, like lightning, flashes through. No, it doesn't sound like thunder. It's a peace that makes me whole. The voice of God, a silent spirit who illuminates our souls. Elijah prayed. Elijah listened. And he could sort through the noise and recognize God's voice because his ears were prepared to hear. Not some fuzzy feeling, but rather makes things clear by timeless tooth revealing to ears prepared to hear. And prepared means spending time with God, in God's word, regularly, so you'll recognize his voice of truth. And even though he will speak softly, if your heart is open and true, the power of his word like lightning will come through. The new Revised Standard Version Translation of 1 Kings 19.12 uses the word sheer silence instead of whisper. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Take time regularly to sort through the noise in your life and spend time in God's word so you'll be prepared to recognize your father's voice when he whispers to you in sheer silence. Elijah was as completely human as we are. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, makes it very, uh, very real, the way that those poems speak to your heart. And thank you for sharing that with us. And, even now as we go into prayer and as we prepare our hearts to receive communion uh, this morning, uh, may God speak to you and may God affirm you, and affirm his love, his forgiveness, and his calling for you. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you do come. 
and you desire to reach each heart, each person here today uh, with your word, with your promises. And that, God, we uh, offer ourselves to you and we recognize you as uh, the one true God above all gods. You are faithful. You are trustworthy and thankful for how you have made a way for us to enter your throne of grace through, the, uh, through your son, our Savior, Jesus. God, we pray today and offer ourselves to you, and we pray as you call us to pray for those in need. We uh, pray for those who have been hospitalized recently and we continue to lift up Dottie Cook and her surgery tomorrow for a Buzz Walker and the care he's receiving, his wife Gloria. Lord, for others that are on our hearts right now, we just pause and, and give them to you as we pray. And Lord, we lift up our, our world in need uh, that needs you, Lord, that uh, may, may your peace come. We pray for our nation, for its leaders and our military, and uh, especially in this tight, heightened time of just anxiety and wars and rumors of wars. And we pray for the nations of the world, God, wherever. Uh, God, you are all, uh, you know all things, and we give all things to you. We just pray for uh, uh, people to turn to you, uh, for us, Lord, first, humble ourselves and on our knees to turn to you, and for, uh, for people everywhere to come to know you, Lord, and the hope, the promise, the peace that is found in you. So we pray for uh, guidance, uh, for your love and mercy. Uh, and pray for those affected by uh, just devastating times, whether it's uh, wildfires in Australia and the recovery there, or right here close to home too, people going through trial and struggle. Lord, we just uh, pray for uh, your, your, your love, your peace, and your healing. And God, we pray that you'd come now as we celebrate Holy Communion. We uh, just pray that you'd come and descend upon each heart. Lord, that your peace would reign and your forgiveness and grace. In Jesus' name we pray.